Hello and welcome back to the Icelandic Roundup. My name is Josie Ann Gatins. I am culture editor at the Reykjavik Grapevine. No Valor with us this week. He's on holiday for this month. Um, and apologies for no podcast last week. It was our print week last week. Um, so that means that our new issue is now out online and around Reykjavik. If you're in town, you can pick up a copy. And if you want a physical copy and you're not here, it's also available to purchase for worldwide delivery in our shop, which is shop.grapevine.com. Is. Um, we've got some really interesting articles in there, including a main feature about uh, Instagram and social media and travel. We'll be talking about that later. But first, I just want to mention our sponsor this week, which is the Lava Centre. It's an interactive volcano exhibition centre in the south of Iceland. It's a totally immersive experience. We really recommend it, especially for those travelling with kids. It's just fascinating to learn about what's happening under your feet as you explore Iceland. So thanks to Lava Centre for sponsoring this podcast. Um, and I'm really excited to introduce a very exciting guest on the podcast this week. He's a well-known photographer, adventurer, director and public speaker. He's passionate about documenting wild and beautiful places and sharing this travel experience with millions of fans and followers online. He's already undertaken a great number of projects in Iceland, including a film Unner with uh, Eli Thor, the... Uh, the words come out my head, surfer, that's the one, um, <laughs> as well as a solo cycle around Iceland in 52 ice hours, which is the fastest time recorded. Uh, welcome to the Icelandic Roundup, Chris Burkard. I'm super happy to be here. Thanks for having me. We are delighted to have you. Yeah. Um, maybe you could start by just telling us a little bit about yourself. How did you get involved in photography and how did that story ultimately mm. lead you to Iceland? It's a, it's a slightly long story, so I don't want to eat up too much time. But I mean, ultimately, um, I I grew up in in a, like a really small community, small town. Mm -hmm. um, it was just me and my mom, single parent home, and uh, we didn't I didn't travel growing up. I didn't really go anywhere. I didn't even own a passport actually. Wow. And so, okay. Um, I feel like when I picked up a camera, it wasn't like I saw it as this art form. It wasn't like this, oh my gosh, I'm going to create art and it's going to be so beautiful. Mm -hmm, I saw mm -hmm. it as purely like a tool to get out of that small town, to see the world, to to get away from like the dinner table conversations and the six o'clock news and just this kind of what felt like a slightly constricting experience mm -hmm. growing up. And I started to use the camera as a tool to document friends and surfers and whatnot. And ultimately it led me to a... Um, a staff photography position at um, a couple of surf magazines in mm -hmm. California. And that was really my bread and butter, so to say. That was like where I cut my teeth was shooting editorial, shooting for magazines, um, and, and trying to create stories or assignments that would take me to amazing places. The first time I traveled internationally was to Oman and Yemen and Dubai. Wow. Um, the world comes at you really fast, and it was really eye-opening. And I think that to kind of shorten the story – I felt like I was going to these places, um, you know, the, the South Pacific, Central America, South America, Australia, where yes, there was adventure there, but it's kind of like what I was experiencing was like strong Wi-Fi, great food and like a hotel right on the beach. Mm. And you were sort of selling this idea of adventure, but it wasn't really there. It just wasn't, it wasn't what I was after. And it felt like the photographs after a period of time, when I started to travel, it felt like they were a little bit um, meaningless in some way, or at least meaningless to me, right? right? Somebody who was trying to, to share this bigger, broader experience. And, um, when I first kind of set my sights on cold water surfing, it was obscure. This is like 2006, 2005, something yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, it was obscure. It was like, who does that? Why would anybody want to get in a, you know, five millimeter wetsuit, seven millimeter gloves and go surf in freezing cold water? And, Ultimately, it led me to places like Norway, the Faroe Islands, mm -hmm. Lofoten, Alaska, Russia, uh, and Iceland. And I remember so vividly that first trip being here. Um, I think it was 2006, maybe. Okay. Um, not like forever ago, but it was different, obviously. Really and, um, different back then. And, you know, you would you would show up at these beaches, like down in Vik, and you would be like, oh my gosh, the surf is perfect, but it's mm. so scary. Yeah. Um, and being, you know, here with professional athletes and, and mm -hmm. being able to understand the ocean, we felt safe and we, we went exploring. We went to the West Fjords, we went to the South, we went to the North, to Husavik, and we found incredible surf. And I think that that story, that experience, it really stuck with me, that young 
um, impressionable mind of, mm-hmm. of mine at the time was like, this is it. Like, this is what I want. I don't, I don't know what it was about the place, about the people, about the, the experience, but I felt compelled to kind of find an excuse to come back. Right. Um, and like everybody does. And, um, <laughs> I, but I couldn't really, you know, I didn't, I didn't grow up with money. I didn't really have that opportunity. So I couldn't justify just coming back for vacation. In fact, I don't think I traveled anywhere on a plane for a vacation until I was like 10 years into my career, like in right. my thirties. Yeah. So I would try to find jobs to bring me back here. I would, I would pitch these assignments being like, yeah, I'll come here with some kite surfers. Right. I ended up shooting a couple Apple jobs here. Uh-huh, um, I ended uh-huh. up producing a, a, a Jeep shoot. I ended up just doing anything, guiding, doing workshops. I just kind of realized that I wanted to be here. And at a certain point, I sort of realized like, well, why do I need to keep finding excuses to be here? Like, can I just be there and experience it and like mm-hmm. live and, and enjoy my life there? And um, when I had kids, it, it ultimately dawned on me that like the greatest gift I could give my kids is to show them how a different culture lives and exists, one mm-hmm. that I really respect and one that I really love. And so now really when I come, yeah, I still work and I still do projects and I still try to um, explore, you know, remote places and document that. But really, I just enjoy being in the community, showing my wife and my kids the community and, mm-hmm. and letting them kind of experience it. Because at a certain point, you, you just can't, you know, you can't, you're never going to have the same experience going to Skoga Foss for the 50th time. Like, it's right. just going to yeah. not be the same, yeah. right? Yeah. But there is some joy when you take somebody new there. When you take somebody yes. new to these places and you see it from their eyes, you're like, oh my gosh. That's what I felt the first time I saw it. And mm-hmm. and that's special. And even more so when you take them somewhere more remote, you know, you yeah. take them into the highlands or whatever. So long story short, um, that's what led me here. That's why I'm here right now. And now I, I live here part time. Um, I guess you could say that, you know, probably uh-huh. four months out of the year. Cool. Um, I really try to spend the summers here and then usually come in the winter. So, yeah. It's brilliant. I mean, I think... You kind of touched on something that I hear a lot. I mean, obviously I'm here. I'm not from Iceland originally myself. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that you can really divide people who come to Iceland into two camps. The the people who are like, that was great. I loved that holiday. Mm -hmm. And the people are like, how do I come here all Mm -hmm. the time? Mm -hmm. Um, And I (laughs) think I'm still trying to put my finger on exactly what it is Mm -hmm. that is so captivating about Iceland in that way. What do you think? What, how, what have, in your experience, you've traveled over, yeah. you know, so much of your life. Yeah. What is it about Iceland that makes you want to keep coming back here? You know, that's a great question. And I've luckily been asked that before. So I, I'm, I'm cheating. <laughs> I'm cheating because I can answer that. And I, I re- I've thought deeply about it. Uh-huh. I and mean, I think that given the time that I've had in this country and the opportunity that I've had to be so immersed in its landscapes, you know, whether I'm on a bike or whether I'm on a boat or whether I'm, yep. you know, whatever on the glacier, I thought deeply about that. And I really think that it comes down to one thing and that's that classic, iconic Icelandic saying, that 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 dust, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah, Which, yeah. for those who don't <laughs> know, I mean, obviously Icelanders know, but for those who don't know it, it, it kind of loosely translates to like, it'll all work out. Yeah. It'll all work out. And that seems kind of funny at first, Mm. but when you really think about it, what does that mean? It means that for the last thousands of thousand years, thousands of years, Icelanders have never been able to like plan a wedding six months in advance Mm -hmm. because they don't know what the weather's going to do. Yeah. They don't know if a volcano is going to explode and destroy all the crops. They don't know if a flood is going to happen. You don't know if the surf is going to be big or they don't, they don't know. They've lived their lives absolutely in the moment. Yeah. And they've done so yeah. because they are in so many ways, in so many ways, kind of the weather has their finger mm-hmm, mm-hmm. on them. Yeah. You know, like you, you think about, you know, the Vindu, you think about the wind and you're like, the wind alone can just completely change your plans. Yeah. And I think that there is beauty in being in a culture, unlike any other I've ever seen, where they are totally, totally subjected to... Um, living in the moment. Yeah. And obviously it's changing now because, because like anywhere else, you know, you, you know, with, with, um, access to, you know, modern conveniences, mm. you don't need to do that as much, but I think it's still very deeply rooted in who they are. And Absolutely. I, and I'm sure you see it too. And I, and I really love that. I think that's the thing that draws me back. It's almost like in California where I'm from and where I've been, you know, you kind of just are looking forward to the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. And when I'm here, I feel more immersed 
mm. in this place. And I feel like it slows me down a little bit to appreciate where I am. And that's like in a world that's getting louder and louder, oddly enough, I think Iceland's one of like the last quiet places in my mind. Yeah. Even with two million tourists a year. I don't think that, you know, me being one of them, I don't <laughs> think that it's loud. I think it's actually still very quiet. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is like as someone whose life uh, personally revolves around planning a lot of things, mm. better at dust is both like the joy and bane of mm. my existence, I have to I, say. <laughs> I will totally. I, I also know there's a totally a challenging side to it mm. because maybe sometimes um, as, as many Icelanders know, and they, they, they self admit that like, they're not always the best at long-term planning, yeah. but, but you get it. You're like, you know, and that's just a part of the culture. It's a beautiful thing, you know? Yeah. I mean, being forced to roll with it, I think sometimes really does help the mm -hmm. way that you approach life. So I do appreciate it for sure. But I mean, I think it's interesting you're saying as well about this, this whole idea of kind of living in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've been working in this industry for quite a long time mm -hmm. and it's an industry that has changed dramatically in yeah. that space yeah. um, from going from, you know, having to carry around huge cameras and mm. lots of equipment, although that's still part of a lot of professional filmmaking and photography, we are now all photographers yeah. we Everybody, all have yeah. uh everybody you know, has a tool pretty much all of us have mm -hmm. a carry a camera far better than we could have possibly mm -hmm. imagined yeah. in our pocket all yeah. the time how have you seen that change the well, way that things go it's interesting um i mean this obviously encroaches upon the subject of the latest issue you mm -hmm. know social media and these effects and i've been really lucky to kind of uh have social media and or media in general mm. photography film be at the forefront of my career the entire time like when I decided to be a photographer I quit my job and I quit college and I never went back wow. and I just pursued photography so I am not the most you know well trained I'm not the most technologically advanced I'm even I'm definitely not the most well spoken um <laughs> and well learned um out there but I try to lead with vulnerability and I try mm. to lead with emotion and I try to in some capacity feel like when I'm using a tool like a camera and I call it a tool because to me that's what it is I, I try yeah. to realize that the story the photograph is only going to go so far you need to tell a story so yeah mm -hmm. everybody is a photographer now it's kind of what you're getting at like we yeah. all have the tools but is everybody a storyteller right I don't think so and I think that what I hope for is that the next sort of wave of tourists aren't tourists but travelers mm. and conscious ones at that people that learn to tell a story people that advocate for wild spaces people that want to share what they learned who they met and why not just check boxes off of an imaginary list that they created before they came here because they saw it online and they felt in some way like their trip was going to be unsuccessful if they didn't see those places. We yes. used to we used to wax romantically and poetically about going down dirt roads to find what was there as like a, you know, you know, mm. maybe it's like a line from a country song, but we used to do that. Nowadays it's kind of like our trips are predicated upon like who what where when why these yeah. five places and you kind of hit these things and you know it's challenging because um I I know that influencer culture has a lot to do with that, but it's also the moment you step on the plane, mm. the moment you step on the plane, what do you see on the back of the headrest? You Absolutely. see a photograph of a place. The millions and millions and millions of dollars get poured into those marketing and advertising campaigns. Um, like you shouldn't take that lightly. You know, yeah. yeah, there are people out there who are influencing millions of people, but from the moment you step on the plane and the moment you, you it's like, oh yeah, here's a one day excursion. Yeah. Where can you go in one day? Mm. The entirety of the marketing campaign around, you know, uh, you know, the, the free stopover. It's like, what could you do in a day? Well, you can only really go to one place. Yeah. A six hour stretch of coast that's heavily impacted by tourism while you have farmers and fishermen in the north that like gave up the farm and made Airbnbs with the hopes of tourism that never yeah. came. And so I think that within that, it's such a complicated issue because it's my opinion, and I only say this because I wrote a book on it mm. um, called At Glacier's End. It was a project about um, Iceland's river system and sort of extractive industries mm. and sort of the relationship there. It's really a kind of not so much an opinion piece as much as we just interviewed Andres Snerd Magnuson and other yes. writers and people we really admired. And 
I was able to take that content and share it at the um, environmental conference about two years ago that I was asked to speak at. So when I think of tourism, my, my opinion is that Iceland doesn't really have a tourism problem. It has a planning problem. Where I come from in the national parks where I live in California, they have yeah. 7 million visitors a year yeah. in a tiny, tiny place mm-hmm. called Yosemite Valley. Yeah. 7 million people. But when you're there, you can be totally alone. Yeah. Totally isolated. And so I think that when I when I look at the country of Iceland, how big it is, I feel like there's opportunities for people to be ev- go everywhere, to, to spread out, to explore. And I think that if I take any responsibility, of, you know, to kind of get back to your original question, are we all photographers? I think it when I'm here, I try to really advocate for where am I, where am I sort of urging people to go see where am i urging them to go explore what are the what are the stories that i'm sharing and are those stories going to motivate them to like you know get off the tourist path and go explore somewhere deeper go to that small remote town that they can't even pronounce Mm. to try that fish restaurant that they've only heard of or i think like i feel like the weight of that responsibility sometimes on my shoulders to try and advocate for um for those places you know and 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 that's kind of what's led me to like you know, to create the West Fjords Way cycling race with some other amazing people is like now people get to ride their bike, human powered adventure through Flattery and Thingity and Patrick's mm-hmm. Fjord. And, and that's so cool to me. Like, that's very fulfilling. Sorry, long winded answer. No, it's I'm just rambling so now. So interesting. And I mean, so to, to sort of uh, lead a little bit more to this this piece, we were uh, lucky as well to interview Jules. And you of wrote all this, things. this yes. Yeah, it's yeah, really, yeah, it's really well done. It's Thank great. you. I, it's, a, it's a real, it's a, I think it's a really interesting conversation that I'm looking forward to more people having, mm-hmm. having in Iceland. Um, where I'm from in Scotland, it's a big part of uh, conversation at the moment. Great. And where I in think Scotland are you from? I'm from the Highlands of Scotland. So again, beautiful. we're beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Love it up there. Yeah. Lots of tourism, yeah. not necessarily the infrastructure. No, to cope no, with not it. Right. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, yeah, so Kiana Sue Powers and Jules from All Things Iceland. Um, and one of the things that I was interested in, and you've kind of talked about it a little bit, was this idea as well. There's the kind of the, the two sort of conflicting drives in mm. tourism at the moment, I feel. One of which is this kind of bucket list approach mm. with the kind of Instagram iconography. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but the other is this kind of like this cult of authenticity is what I refer to it as in in the yeah. in the piece um which I feel there's a lot of pressure on the people who kind of represent the tourism industry mm. you being one of them mm. yeah. to produce content that's kind of like ever more authentic authentic yeah, and, yeah. and to bear a bit of your soul I mean yeah. like, what's the 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 behind the scenes for that in your life yeah. like you know is there does it feel sometimes like everybody kind of wants a piece of you or that you're expected to um, share things that you know you're just like there's yeah. no barrier there definitely sometimes isn't a barrier um I, I you know I'm not gonna bore you with the analytics of like what it's like in my direct messages where I just get <laughs> thousands of direct messages from people <laughs> basically wanting me to play travel agent for them. Yes. Which is kind of funny, but I also, I, I, tr- I honestly try to do it. Like I try to help people and be like, like when people ask me, mm. where should I go see in Iceland? I, I, I will tell them. But the problem is, is it's not that easy of a question. Yeah. And I mean, I get this question everywhere in the world. Where should I go in Alaska? Where should I go mm. in the Aleutians? Where should I go here? Like I've, you know, where should I go in Russia? It's like a part of me, I, f- I feel almost indebted to the places I I spend time. Mm. I generate work, um, that places that kind of feed me my soul and, mm, and mm-hmm, me physically mm-hmm. and emotionally and spiritually, whatever, to like give back. And so oftentimes I will tell people like, yeah, you know, you should go check out this place. But I, it the problem is it's not that easy of a question because I need to know like, what do you want to do? Who are you traveling with? Yes. Do you have kids? Do you like to hike? Do you want to be in the car? Do you want to go on a boat? Like I don't, <laughs> like it's such a complicated thing. It's like, what camera should I use? I'm like, that's the most broad question you could ever ask. And guess what? I will help you, but I need to narrow it down. And I, I guess a part of it comes from this idea. Like when I was a young kid seeking photography as a career, I reached mm-hmm. out to so many people for help. And this was like prior to social media, you know, whatever. Yes. And yeah, nobody yeah, yeah. wanted to give, nobody wanted to help me. Nobody cared. I, I And I promised myself, I was like, you know, if I ever make it yeah. and this is a career, I'm going to do my 
damnedest to help people and yeah. and not be that person. So I, I do overextend myself. I probably should say no more yeah. because there are times where it kind of encroaches upon my personal life. But I will say like I I feel a sense of responsibility to try and lead people in the right direction. But I've noticed that you can't give somebody a roadmap if they don't know the destination. Like if they don't right. know what they want yes. and they don't know what they want to experience because mm-hmm. I'm kind of like, well, what do you want? What's on your to-do list? And if somebody's like, honestly, I don't even care. I'm like, great. Yeah. But if they're like, oh, I need to see this. I need to see that. And, and I'm like, yeah. well, you kind of already have the trip planned out. Like I'm not going to tell you to go up to flat today yes. and go like to this amazing pier and jump off and, and swim in this beautiful like white sand beach if you need to go see Skogafoss. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah. and I, I've asked people that. I'm like, can you go to Iceland and not see this and yes. be okay with it? Yeah. And sometimes people are honest and sometimes people are like, well, I, I need to, you know, yeah. like it's all, and, I, and I get it. I also understand. I understand that to go here and to not see some of that would be a bit of a bummer. Um, but I do think that as you mentioned and as the article really dives into the, the cult of authenticity and or just the thirst, mm. the need, the insatiable need to kind of feed this social media beast is is challenging mm-hmm. for everybody who considers themselves a content creator. And, you know, I'd be lying if I didn't say that I considered myself that. And I'd be lying if I didn't say I was not an influencer. Is mm-hmm. that my main job? No. Yeah. Could I shut down social media and make a living? Yes. Yeah. What I do for a living, which most people don't know, is I'm a male model. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, no, I, I'm a commercial photographer and um, and a lot of the assignments that I shoot, people never see. Yes. You know, like I was here producing a, um, producing a piece for Nat Geo, like three months in January, mm-hmm, you know, just mm-hmm. as a producer, right? Yeah. Stuff that like people that I'm not sharing, people don't see, people are like, why are you here? They think I'm just always like, are you just, you know, here to influence? I'm like, no, no, I'm just working. Yes. You just so happen to be lucky to get a preview into my life because I, I enjoy sharing it. Yes. But it's, it's complicated because it's not like there's some magic dust potion recipe where, you know, you, you go somewhere, you share it and you just make money. Mm-hmm. Maybe if you're, you, maybe there is, and I just don't know about it. <laughs> to be honest, my career is really, it's a pure hustle. Mm-hmm. It's a hundred thousand percent of a hustle. I don't have a retainer from a magazine anymore. Yeah. I'm a freelance photographer. Every assignment that I get, that's my next paycheck. Yeah. Everything I do, that's my next paycheck. Um, and so I really do respect the people that are out there working as, you know, content creators and influencer because they're, they're trying to be creative. They're, mm-hmm. they're living in a very, um, usually a very paycheck to paycheck way. It's, there is no, you know, job security within that, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I respect it a lot. And I, and I think a lot of times it's easy to like look down upon it, but honestly, um, it's a tough job. It is a tough job. And I would say, I would say that just to give social media another huge praise most of the people in my life that I have shared incredibly meaningful, incredibly deep, incredibly like real experiences with, I've met because of social media. Mm-hmm. Almost everybody I work yeah. with in my office, yeah. my yeah. friends, people that I've suffered with on trips, people that I'm doing an expedition with next week. Like these are all people that I've met through this app. And the one thing I would say is that people love to vilify social media, but mm. what they don't think about is the fact that all it is, all it is, is a glorified texting tool. Yeah. And if you use it like that, then it's really built to connect you with people. Mm-hmm. You'll find success, you'll you're, you're you'll grow whatever if you use it to connect people, but if you don't like people, maybe it's not the best thing to use. <laughs> like it's a people engaging yeah. tool. Yeah. And I enjoy people. I, I love people. Mm-hmm. I think that's one of the coolest things and I, and I just I try to really see the good in it. And I try to see the good in everything, I think maybe yeah. to a fault. And, and I know that there's complications around it. Like I, I, that's what I loved about the article is like you, you painted the, it in both lights. You didn't mm. just pick a side and go, well, this is it. No, because it's a complex discussion. Yeah. And I've seen articles where people are just like, oh, the social media is the, is the death sentence of this country. And I'm like, you know, yeah, well, you know, it's complicated because tourism is actually the alternative to extractive industries. Absolutely. And I'm just going to be real. Like I, I live in a country where like this is happening all the time. Every day we're fighting for some public land, some national park, yeah. some forest, some whatever. Yeah. Iceland is a much smaller example of that, but unchecked, you know, and even now there are plans to dam rivers. There are plans to create more luminous yeah. filters. And, yeah. you know, it's not my place as just a visitor to, you know, 
blast my opinion of that mm-hmm. because I understand that sometimes that creates jobs and sometimes that feeds into the economy. But I will say that from a historical example, that tends to usually end poorly. Yes, it's it's definitely. And it, and it is a complicated situation with... Um, you know, that there's there's an argument to be made that the, the people who live here, you know, want that there's a working landscape, mm. that it that it's uh, as much about the people are as part of a place totally. as much as anything. And again, yeah. this is something that's a very developed conversation in Scotland. And yeah. I'm glad that it's happening Me here too. now, too. But I, you know, I really I, I very much agree with with the points you're making. And um, I really would love to hear as well a little bit more about this trip that you're going oh, gosh. on next week. Because yeah. I hear I know a little bit, but I would love to uh, hear you explain it. <laughs> but it's kind of funny. I mean, like I'm, I'm actually... I get, this is the only thing I actually get nervous talking about sometimes is <laughs> upcoming expeditions. Yes. Well, you can, you can keep it. No, no, no. It's, it's not because yeah. I want to keep it a secret. It's because like when you speak it, you speak it into existence. Yes. You know, and you're like, well, I have to do it now. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm going to do it, but <laughs> whether I'm going to be successful, I don't know, to be honest, mm. but that's sort of like, that's sort of important. You know, like I think in some ways if we're picking projects, if we're picking trips, if we're picking films sure. that we we just like guaranteed success, what's the point in that? Well, like, also, you, what is success yeah. and how do you measure that? Yeah, like, well, I think that the, in this situation, success would be survival. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I really hope we can just and ensure and that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a very real thing. I also like, after um, documenting the volcano on behalf of Nat Geo, my focus was search and rescue um, mm-hmm. for that. Mm-hmm. I have a really deep respect for SAR, ISAR and, mm-hmm. and what they do and knowing them and... Um, and I, and I, the last thing I want to do is impose, um, just because I want to go out and have fun, mm. you know, I don't want to impose, um, you know, anybody into, uh, you know, trying to rescue me. So I'm, I've been <laughs> taking very real steps to be safe To yes. Um, I've scouted the route with a plane. Mm-hmm. My plan is to ride my bike and raft. So I have a raft that it deflates down to like five pounds. It goes wow, in a backpack. Okay. I inflate it. I put my bike on the nose. And then I will cross every river on the south coast from Thrupavogur all the way to Thorlikshofen, basically passing Skaftafell, you know, the mouth right there. Yeah. We're riding on the sand. We'll pass Ingushofti Lighthouse. We'll pass, um, you know, Vik, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be passing, you know, basically riding on the sand, riding on yeah. the sand and the kind of outer banks, the barrier islands. Uh-huh. I'm not going to lie. Like, it's very dangerous. And the reason that we want to do it is because I feel like there is an incredibly deep meaningful and rich history on hidden in those sandbars. Absolutely. I mean, people know about, you know, the, the stories of the Dutch gold ship that's uh-huh. out there and the survival shelters that were built for the thousands of shipwrecks along that shore. And I think that when a, when a project can take you through the history of a place, it, it allows for everybody, not just me, but for mm-hmm. everybody who follows along, um, to kind of have this deep and immersive experience. And I think that we only get to appreciate what we have now if we can look back at the past and sort of understand where we've come. And to be honest, like, think about how many people migrated to Iceland early back in the day, you know, and they arrived on the South Coast. It's the mm-hmm. biggest mm-hmm. stretch of coast. It was where most of the ships would probably come in. And I think what would happen from what people have told me is they would be, you know, sailing and coming from France and Spain yeah. and, and, and Norway and whatever. And they would see the beautiful coastline, Skogafoss and everything. They would see, you know, the mountains along the yeah, South yeah. Vik. Like, we're here. And then they wouldn't realize that, you know, the sea is black. It's dark. Yeah. It's sandy. The, o- the sand is black. It's dark. It's sandy. <laughs> and they would just crash into it. Yeah. So it's crazy to me that on that stretch of coast, 300 miles of coastline, there's all these lighthouses and survival shelters yeah. in the middle of nowhere. I mean, the middle of nowhere, like on a flat black sand beach because shipwreck was so common. And I think for years, like you, like everybody else, I've driven that stretch of coast yeah. so many times, like yeah. endlessly. And you look out to the ocean and you're like, what's out there? And I guess when you have those questions, sometimes you just need to answer them and I want to find out. And it's kind of cool to me that like, this is honestly the only way to really see it all. You mm-hmm. couldn't walk it, you know, because you couldn't carry enough supplies. You couldn't yeah. carry enough food. Yeah. You, you, um, riding a bike is fast enough. Um, but definitely like, I'm not afraid of failing. And I think that I will learn a lot and I hope that I'll have a lot to share. And if anything, I hope to like 
maybe make some people in the country sort of proud of their heritage and what people went through. And, yeah. you know, Iceland's all about survivor culture. And I, I sort of love that. And I love to be able to give a little bit of that. So, um, but yes, getting sucked out to sea is very much a real concern. <laughs> and um, I've, I've been, I've Hope been your thinking wife about is listening to this podcast. Yeah, uh, no, uh, no. I mean, I, th- I think it's incredible. And I, I think to kind of go back to something that you were saying earlier, I think, you know, what has drawn me and many people to be following your work for such a long time is this emphasis, this focus on storytelling. I um, Maybe just to sort of like to wrap us up in this conversation, like yeah. what what do you think it is that, you know, you're, you're talking about um, Instagram and, and, and social media as mm. as a way of as a glorified messaging service mm. like yeah. in this era where we are so connected and yet so many people still within that seem to be feeling more isolated than Mm. ever what is it about story that you think is so important and why are we still Mm. seeking that from from the people that we follow these days that's such a good question i think that to get very meta for a second (laughs) we're having a podcast why is podcast so popular Mm. why do people want to put their earbuds in and listen to two people have a conversation because we've been doing that for thousands of years yeah we've been sitting around campfires Mm -hmm. telling stories to me growing up those were the most meaningful experiences like Mm. being in the mountains with my my brothers or with my friends like telling stories icelanders have sagas Mm. what are sagas they're stories Mm -hmm. sometimes when you don't have books and you don't have the tools to to share something that's been written down. You have to tell it. And so yeah. Iceland has this vocal kind of history where they would, you know, during long winter nights, they would, you know, tell stories of the seven Santa Claus. You know, like yeah, that's yeah, what's yeah, so cool. Yeah. And I think in a place like this, especially in the, the north, yeah. like the northern hemisphere in general, whether it's Alaska, whether it's Norway, Pharaohs, this exists. Mm. Um, people have long winters. It's dark. You have to entertain your kids. Yeah. You have to entertain <laughs> yourselves. And so, so I think that to me, like this is why I'm fascinated with, um, with the Arctic and the subarctic and just these areas because I think people are uh, they have they're, they're good storytellers. They have deep and meaningful mm. stories. And I think that in general, I look for ways to kind of not just, you know. I think that the very worst thing we can do when it comes to social media is to um, try to describe to somebody what they can already see. Mm. I always give this advice to photographers. like They're like, oh, what, what can I do to make my social media better? What can I do to make my photos better? I'm like, when you share it, think about this. You were the one that was there. You felt the wind on the back of your neck. You, your feet crunched through the snow. You saw the northern lights for the first time and you felt all these things. It was visceral. Yes, but then you share a photo and you just simply say, the mountains are calling and I must go yeah. to, to steal a quote from John Muir, right? Yep, yep, yep. Um, Which has been posted so many times. I mean, times. you get yeah. it. Like, it's, it's, it, you do yourself a disservice. You do the place a disservice. Yeah. I, I want to see somebody give a piece of themselves. And I'm not saying that being super vulnerable is for everybody, but I do think there's something to be said for vulnerability, um, sharing emotion, mm. and kind of just trying to share something deeper. And for me, I guess what I've realized is that, yeah, social media is one tool, but also making films, making books, you know, doing podcasts. I I just, I guess that what I'm getting at here is I think that the world as a whole will become a better place if we're connecting on a deeper level, if we're building more bridges and less walls. And I would say that in a podcast format or in like, around a campfire, like anybody could be friends. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I know that that sounds a little like optimistic, but the truth is like you can find common ground. Yeah. Yeah. When you're sitting online and you're arguing, you're using, you know, social media or any media as a tool to just, you know, be contentious. Like you're going to find contention. Yeah. And so I think that it's about how we use it. It's about finding common ground. It's about hearing new perspectives. It's, it's about watching films or listening to talks or whatever it is where you are seeing someone be vulnerable because I think that that vulnerability <clears throat> and maybe letting the ego go a little bit is sort of a big part of what um, makes us connect with people. Yeah. And I guess that's kind of how I try to approach the projects I'm doing now mm-hmm. is like 
you know, you had mentioned that film Unner, you know, like that film was so important to me because it was about a dear friend of mine in Iceland, Ellie Thor and his daughter and his relationship with risk and parenthood and all these things. And, you know, I made that project not only because I, I love him, but also like that's something I deal with. Yes. And so in some ways I'm sort of sharing my own experience through his experience Yeah. and I'm trying to come to grips with that. And that film, you know, it won a ton of awards. It was, it was so highly regarded by a lot of like parents out there. And, I, and I'm so grateful for that because we didn't do it to make money. We did it to, to share, um, a story yeah, and a story that people relate to. And I just think, um, those are the types of projects. That's the type of storytelling that to me is the most meaningful. Is that what's going to like pay the bills forever? Probably not. But I think that to feed our souls, that's needed, you know, it's needed to do things like that. So, and uh, just like this upcoming trip, I don't know, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, who knows? <laughs> I, I think that was a wonderful way of putting it. And thank you so much for, for coming and joining us. Thank you um, so much. I, I really, I was so funny. I literally was at the, the pool, the, uh -huh. my, the close to my place. Um, and I picked this up, right? Your, your, the magazine yeah. right in front. And I was like, Oh, what an interesting article. And I read through and I know Jewel, uh, uh -huh, Jules, yeah. she, I've, I've been on her podcast. Yes. Um, and I was like, this is so cool. And then you randomly reached out and <laughs> now we're here. And I just think that's like, that's the beauty of, this small city. Yes. You know, I love it. So. It's so, it is, it's so wonderful. And you just know if someone's in town, it's just like, you're like, yeah. oh, I'm going to get in touch. And like, you're like yeah. they're only like 10 minutes away yeah. at most. They're somewhere <laughs> around, you know? So. Well, we're going to go on to uh, weather and roads briefly for those of you who are also in town. Mm -hmm. um, so the roads update are that some of the routes in the Highlands are now open, but due to thawing conditions, all traffic is still prohibited on some of the F roads. Please do check road.is for detailed information about what roads are still closed or hashtag Iceland Roads on Twitter, although a lot of that is in Icelandic. So I recommend road.is. We have links to this in the description. And weather-wise, uh, Tuesday today is variable with winds between 3 to 8 metres per second. Um, north In the northwest, it'll be between 8 and 13 metres per second at first, near the northeast coast. Um, partly to mostly cloudy and mainly dry but drizzle or rain in the southwest and in the afternoon in the afternoon temperature between 8 and 18 degrees warmest in the southeast um heading later into the week wednesday to friday we've got cloudy but fairly dry across the country starting to rain on wednesday evening and into thursday drying up in the east on friday but remaining drizzly in the west temperatures between 8 and 18 degrees warmest in the east and southeast light winds becoming stronger across the highlands on friday do be aware of that if you're planning to be there and on Saturday southerly wind and partly rain but mostly dry in the northeast and east temperatures again 10 to 18 degrees warmest in the northeast and that's everything from me today and from Chris thank you again mm. so much for joining us thank really you. enjoyed our conversation and we'll definitely be following your project as Super you go, go on yeah I'm to meet you um, please remember to rate and review the Icelandic Roundup in your podcast app and if you want to get in touch with us the email address is grapevine at grapevine.is we'll see you next week sweet sweet <laughs>